Alright, so freshly learning about uh, her two SAG nominations that just came out. Uh, what better time than to go into Blunt's TV movies, at least a couple of them. Uh, and there were there were a couple of things TV-wise I really, really looked for and couldn't find. There's a, a TV movie called The Strange Case of Sherlock Holmes and Arthur Conan Doyle, which is apparently non-existent now. There's like two pictures of it, and that's about all I could find. And this, uh, Hen I kind of mentioned this in The Young Victoria, the uh, Henry VIII miniseries that she was in with like Mark Strong and a bunch of other people. Uh, I found the first half of, but apparently the first half is the half that she's not in. So uh, I'm not sure where the second half is, but uh, hopefully we'll come across it eventually. But everything else, like uh, her Poirot episode and her episode of Foil's War and all that, um, are all going to be in a uh, in the the Empire uh, miniseries. We'll, we'll talk about it in a couple in a few days or so. Uh, but in the meantime, I just wanted to stick with these two being uh, just sort of in the TV movie category. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention in passing that I never really brought up was uh, this short film that she was in in 2009 called Curiosity, uh, which seems like this really sort of random thing. It's, uh, I think the only version on YouTube is one where it's like dubbed over in another language, but it's, you can find it out there, and it's only like 10 minutes long. Uh, and it's like this really simple thing of her husband or boyfriend, whoever, sees uh, a dude dragging a body outside this really creepy dude, and he basically gets caught looking at this guy, and the guy comes in and attacks them, and that's about it. I mean, it's a it's a little atmospheric, and there are a couple of shots in it that are kind of genuinely creepy. It kind of reminds me of uh, the uh, horror anthology movie VHS from about 2012, the Ty West segment where they're in the motel room, and they're looking out, and the person's in the parking lot. The first half of it's kind of like that, um, but it, also at the same time, though, it's... Uh, there's not really much to it, given especially that the whole thing kind of looks like it was shot on uh, probably a camera like the one I'm looking at right now, and it just looks like really like cheap and like somebody just made it on a whim practically. Um, and but even so, you know, she still has to for the for the small amount of time that this movie is in its entirety, um, she does get to play up what I was talking about with like the Wolfman and Windchill and A Quiet Place and all that, where it's like even if. She said before that she's not exactly a horror fan. Um, it's amazing how well she can play scared shitless, and this is another opportunity to do that. Um, almost like a practice round, probably, for the Wolfman, since it was probably right in that area. Because I looked it up, because I was thinking, like, well, she was already established at this point, and had been for a few years now, and it's like, why even do this? And it's like, who, who did she owe a favor? And I looked up the director, and apparently the director was a... Uh, an additional third assistant director and a um, like a set production assistant on the Wolfman, and he was a floor runner on Young Victoria, and that and he, he's got like a whole bunch of those kind of credits to his name. But as far as his blunt connection, that appears to be it. Um, so somewhere in there, this this little short film came to be, uh, and it's just there on her on her filmography. So that's pretty much what that is. There's really nothing else to say about it. So. Um, I did want to go into uh, Gideon's daughter first, especially given what we're in the whole awards run and she's doing so well so far. Uh, and this was her uh, Golden Globe win. Because you look on a few of her uh, posters for her movies and she's considered Golden Globe winner Emily Blunt. And I, I don't know how many people even realize it's just for this TV movie that was off to the side. Um, especially being overshadowed by the fact that it was the same year she was nominated there for The Devil Wars Prada also, which is where she... You know, her, her name just became known by everyone. Um, and I wasn't quite sure um, when I initially went into it. Like, I don't even remember when I saw it, but, um, or at least the first time. But this whole thing of it being uh, told from the perspective of Robert Lindsay's character going back to 1997, despite coming out in the 2005 2006 area. And it starts off in a way that it, it, it's a little sort of jarring that you're expecting this uh, sort of father-daughter movie, but actually, when it starts off, it's more about, like, celebrity and all that, and his sort of PR job, where he's this... He's basically, like, a fix-it man for politicians and the like. Uh, the first time we see them, they're at this, you know, big movie premiere with all these sort of empty movie stars surrounding them and all that, and there's... 
And there's a whole thing about uh, all the ass kissing that goes on here too. Like Tom Hardy's entire character is basically revolving around that. Um, but then we um, see the way that she sort of reacts there by his side, by Bill Nye's side. Her father in this case. Like I said, we talked about her being a potential love interest to him in Wild Target there. Father and daughter here, and the thing is, um, we can sort of see immediately how she takes this in, in practically total silence, where it's not necessarily just like a distance between her and his lifestyle, or his supposed, what's his lifestyle on the surface anyway, um, but also it's sort of the starting point for us to see the distance between them as father and daughter also, because obviously things bigger, much bigger things will be revealed throughout to show exactly why they're so emotionally distant, um, but like I said, we get a pretty big taste of it immediately just by watching them in circumstances like this, um, where it's like she, we can see that every now and then she's like mildly amused by the way uh, he sits at the back of the room and everybody sort of glances back at him just to try to get that one glimpse without getting caught. Um, but for the most part, um, she would really rather be anywhere else, and there's even uh, that moment I really like when, uh, I think it's the Robert Lindsay character, comes up to their table, and she's just sort of, like, just kind of cringing at the whole thing. Like, she winces when this dude starts talking. Um, and, like like I said, just little moments like that in this very first scene sort of set up uh, where we're going with this relationship between the two of them, even though much bigger things are to be revealed that are already in the past. Um... Because it is, um, I mean, there is like a distance from both sides also, because we get the whole how she seems to have an obvious distance between him and his lifestyle, whereas when you look at look at it from his perspective, there's just something about her that's sort of, even when she's like down the hall, it's like, it almost feels like she couldn't be more farther away. There's even the moment when he's driving down the street and sees her on the sidewalk and it's like practically driving up to a stranger is what it feels like um both for him and us watching it um and like th those scenes where like he watches her just like go to her room or whatever when she's uh when she comes out in the dress and all that and there's just we every shot we get of her in this hallway um she always looks like so far away and then there's the whole thing of um when it's determined that she's going to go to college and he's talking about how, you know, she's always lived down the hallway and it's going to be weird that she won't even be there. But it's like there's there's sort it's almost like it's simultaneously saying the uh, she's always been right there, but she's also kind of always had that distance also. And it's sort of this contrasting thing of um, I guess this is so close yet so far, if you want to use a cliche, but I was trying to avoid that. But um and then there is uh, the whole thing about uh, Nye's performance here, on top of all that, because um, a lot of that has to go through, and not just uh, them together, but what Nye brings himself also. Um, especially when we see the contrast of him when he's like in his element, like it, it, which is just a surprisingly few amount of scenes when we see him like, you know, having dinner and talking business and all that, and he's, like, really into it, when for the re for most of the movie, he's, like, so calm and collected about what he does, and it's, you can tell his business is more, like, methodic on the inside, but on the outside, it's the whole trying to play up the glamour of the, similar to the lifestyles of the people that he represents. Um, but there is definitely that whole underlying thing there that he's able to pull off nicely. Um, and even get some scenes where it's, like, he manages to find some, it's a comedic scene, but albeit, like, some dignity maybe other actors wouldn't have had when he's, like, on his hands and knees looking for a guinea pig and calling to it. Uh, but, and he's able to do all of that, jumping around, and also make this character feel so real and tragic in a way, especially when he meets uh, the Miranda Richardson character, which he ends up, uh, a sort of love story of sorts is happening here. Um, which you wouldn't expect from the circumstances that they meet, uh, and it's not really necessarily the direction you think it's going to go when they first meet, it's just something that sort of gradually, kind of realistically happens, um, and then it's the obvious connection of, uh, the, the way that he knows her is he's obviously, well, he, he was witness to this child that was, uh, killed on his bike, and of course she is the mother of, and the father has this whole this whole big opening scene where we're not quite sure exactly how much this is going to play into the plot and maybe does 
in way like we know it's going to but not in the ways we expect it to um but then there is um the fact that they're both kind of carrying this sort of tragedy and his obviously we'll learn much later and it's like that's really what works about this is the way it like slowly reveals the relationship origins between him and Blunt, which or his life in general. So that also goes into how he opens up with uh, Miranda Richardson's character also, because he's got the it's like because the movie's about an hour forty five. It's like an hour in, uh, and we finally learn this whole thing about uh, when his wife died. It was only young Natasha that was there and was just there with some homeless guy uh, while he was out making phone calls basically because he didn't want to be in the room but he also had all of his other women and all that um, and this sort of, not only is it a tragedy that they're living with but there's also the guilt because while there's a, a very clear, no need to explain it guilt there, um, there's also the thing with Redrithson where it's like she feels, she's never quite forgiven herself for letting uh, the kid be out on that road that was so weirdly constructed that caused this accident. Um, and it's basically these two people finding the connection between each other, but also having that in common with themselves that really brings this sort of, you know, powerful foundation to what's going on with them as they come together. Um, and then obviously there's, um, what Blunt is doing here also, and it's, um, like, one of the standout scenes that just keeps coming back is the scene where she sings on stage at her high school just before she graduates. That is, uh, that does raise some questions about the whole, uh, publicity stuff she was doing for End of the Woods, where she said when she sang for End of the Woods was the first time she'd ever sang in front of anybody. Uh, and she, she does sing a little bit in both these movies. I'm not sure if that's in this, if it's, like, been tampered with or she's lip-syncing, because it's... Because this isn't on the uh, soundtrack listing on her IMDb page, yet something as simple as her singing Happy Birthday in Wild Target is. So it sounds like her, um, but I guess there's a possibility that I, I do... For some reason, research did not help me with this. <laughs> um, so I have no idea, but um, I will choose to believe her that this um, Into the Woods was kind of the first real the real deal kind of thing she did in in uh warrior queen it's like maybe 10 seconds or something it might also not even be her i don't know but um i'm thinking too much about that as opposed to what that does for this performance also because even if you know that might not be her voice um there's still a performance going on here especially with uh because the way she's looking at nye's character as she's singing this uh is once again one of those things that wordlessly says everything about their relationship um, and then there's even that moment when she kind of snaps out of the trance that singing the song practically to him does, where we actually see her go from, like, dead serious as she's singing, and then when the song ends, she, like, immediately smiles and laughs a little bit, and it's just that one moment, too, I think really, uh, comes through in a nice way, but, um... Also, just because for a while there, it almost seems like she's just sort of this background character that's basically just serving Nye's portion of the story. But um, there is, some, especially the big scenes that they have together, like towards the end when it finally seems like she's almost come to an understanding of just how broken he is inside about where their relationship has ended up and all that guilt and that lack of forgiveness for himself and all that and she has to like literally pick him up off the ground and it's really strong scenes like that the scene in the car when she gives him the deadline um all these scenes make it very clear that um it's not like it's there are so many roles of hers that should be multiple award winners and the fact that this is the only one that has like sort of a, a major one that people like know when they hear it um or at least was given on, like, a large platform, I guess I should say, um, is is still very much worthy of that, so, of course. So, uh, it probably helped a little bit having the one-two punch of Delaware's Prada, but that's that kind of goes to the side when you realize not a one for this also. <clears throat> um, and it's, uh, there's even a video of her in the press room, and she doesn't have her trophy with her, and she has to use his uh, while she does all the press stuff. Um, so, so even then you can kind of sense like some sort of relationship, even with little things like that in real life also. Um, and then obviously throughout the movie, there's also going to be uh, really powerful standalone scenes. Like I was talking about the opening with watching this, you know, 
broken, crumbling father trying to recreate his son's death scene for this crowd of people. Um, and then you've got the uh, scene where they're watching Princess Diana's funeral. Uh, and it's like, it's interesting in a, a number of ways where it's... Uh, like, I remember this being, like, a big deal. I, was, I was, must have been six or seven at the time. And I, specific, I had this very vivid memory of my mom watching uh, Princess Diana's funeral on TV and, like, weeping. And in this moment, you see, not only are they watching, like, this historical event, but also to kind of bring in that other side of the story that's going on. you got Tom Hardy sitting here just basically pointing out in this very tragic moment in history, it's like, uh, you know, we potentially started this, like we were influ influential in how they're doing this. Uh, and it's all, it's really all about that, uh, fame and credit and all that. So, um, which once again, kind of tends to both go with and contrast with Nye's character at the same time, depending on how you view, like where his stance is in regards to his career, but the person he really is inside, or like I said, is, contrasting many times when you see it in the, in the in a very skillful way that both the writing and nice performance bring out um so and then you talk about uh how a lot of the scenes of the characters together this is a movie that i can see this movie being a bit maddening for maybe some people um because it does kind of have a nice sort of you know leisurely pace to it but it's also kind of how natural it feels like a lot of the dialogue doesn't feel like written like it's not show-offy dialogue or anything and it does feel like um these characters really are real and saying real things to real people in real situations which i do think is done in a little bit by the whole uh inclusion of the robert Lindsay character having basically seeing it from his pers i know they're doing something here but still um just seeing it from the perspective of his character with the narration and uh him basically being the thing we keep coming back to is I, I don't know that it's totally necessary, even though I see what they're doing, but still, it's it's there. If, if he wasn't good in it, we'd probably have a much bigger problem, but the fact that he's able to do something with that is saves it a little bit. So, um, And like I said, once we get towards the end and we just really get to see these scenes of uh, like the portrayal of parental worry like really taking over these moments when he's like when he sees on TV that attacks are happening in the area that she's in, where he was he was always afraid of her going there anyway, just for the whole aspect of losing her, but now feeling like he could lose her in a totally bigger way, in the way that Richardson's going through. Um, and it's like, like I said, just seeing in the distance and the narration. It's only, I think another problem I have with the narration is that it really spells things out in a way that we really don't need it to, where it's like, when I was looking off into the distance and it's saying like he was trying to basically will her out of harm's way and it's like we you can really kind of get that vibe just watching him uh but it's even so it's still uh, some really powerful stuff also and like I said even when it gets when it gets to the end and it's like when he finally isn't the one that's trying to you know instigate the conversation and he just kind of he's just sitting there broken in silence is when she finally sort of comes out and sees things for what they are and tries to make some sort of connection again. So it's a, it goes nicely in that direction also. So, um, yeah, so like I said, um, probably not a movie a lot, like, everybody's going to fall in love with or anything, but um, as far as, like, um, sort of a performance piece goes, and like I said, in showing, like, writing that feels real with characters that feel real, um, it's really nicely done in that regard, so uh, I appreciate it for that and the fact that we've got at least one trophy to her name so far. Um, hopefully this year will help us out and uh, help her out <laughs> and bring a little more to her, hopefully. So um, that's how I feel about that. Now we'll go on to a movie uh, way down on her resume with uh, Warrior Queen. At least that's what it says on the screen. Sometimes it's known as Boudicca, sometimes it's known as... Boudicca Warrior Queen. So, um, this is the very first credit on her IMDb page. This is what I was talking about, where it's like, she has continuously called My Summer of Love her very first movie. The, technically, this is, but I'm assuming, you, taking TV movies and miniseries out of the equation, yes, My Summer of Love is technically her first movie, but, like I said, it almost half makes me think she's maybe trying to wipe this from existence as well, at least from her filmography, but 
Um, maybe it's not as bad as you would expect a TV movie with this kind of material to do. I know it's another one of those movies that people immediately dismiss and say, like, oh, it's so historically inaccurate, and they weren't even trying to get the facts right and all that, and it's like... Uh, as, as I keep saying to this, number one, um, there is a brand new invention out there called documentaries, which I really highly recommend. They're like really informative and sometimes even entertaining, and they're usually pretty easy to find. Uh, but secondly, it's like, look at this fucking thing. Like, what you... <laughs> it's like, if you're really passionate about this material, is this the kind of thing you really want to seek out? Just, I mean, if you just look at it, you'll, it's, yeah. I mean, obviously I tend to have a bias against, you know cheap looking made for TV movies at least before they before TV was in like the golden age as they say but uh yeah this was like you know early 2000s TV movie like 2003 um and like I said with this kind of material which may not necessarily translate too well to TV at least 2003 TV um and that's yeah so well like I said maybe not as bad as that makes it sound so, like, I mean, we do open, and, um, she's there. Alex Kingston, I believe, from ER, uh, is, uh, Boudica, the warrior queen. And she immediately, in this opening scene, which there's really, there's, they bookend this. There's nothing like this, like, throughout, but, like, the very first shot and the very last shot are this kind of thing, where, um, it's her, and she breaks the fourth wall, to assure the audience that she is not dead because great warriors never die or something. Um, and she even laughs at the notion that we would believe she's dead. Despite the fact that the movie eventually acknowledges present day. But <laughs> anyway, um, it is interesting, first off, uh, when you're watching the opening credits to see that uh, really the main noteworthy thing here is that this is Emily Blunt's real first movie. And she actually ends up playing what is a very crucial part um, yet her name is totally absent from the opening credits, <laughs> so, uh, that could just be a nobody knew who she was at the time thing, but, uh, so yeah, and during these opening credits, we see, uh, Vodica coming home, and she has got a severed head with her, and it's like to show off that she's this big warrior, um, and a queen, no less, uh, she comes home, and even the children, everybody is around, and there's this, everybody's happy, and they're taught, they're passing around these heads, uh, like it's like it's a common gift, uh, and this is the kind of world that we live in, of course. So, um, and every now and then there'll be something that seems a bit off. Once again, historically, not necessarily facts-wise, but stuff like uh, I think you have one character that insists that another character play ball in the metaphorical sense. Um, I didn't research to see if that phrase was around in the time this is set, but um, I had my doubts. So. Um, while we do have Alex Hansen doing her very best to do this sort of a strong lead for a role like this, sort of the female uh, Mel Gibson in Braveheart kind of performance, uh, where she's on the horse, she's got the sword, she's covered in paint, and she's giving a bunch of speeches and all that. Um, I, it, it is one of those cases where I was basically playing spot blunt in the background. Um, and she does actually have, like, a genuine role here, like, it's not just that, where, um, when it starts off, she's got, like, this secret look, she's, uh, Isolde, who is the, one of the daughters of Vodica, and she is, has this, uh, secret lover who's, like, one of the guards of, uh, our main antagonist, and when we see her in these moments, there, these very brief moments at the beginning, there is definitely, it's so interesting how many different, versions of her we've seen throughout her career now because it seemed like at the beginning here she was sort of like this um she got like a bunch of innocent parts like parts that, where these characters just really their innocence is like a major piece of them i'm also thinking of the empire miniseries when i these parts feel a bit similar uh, but then obviously once the key events of the story take place um she gets she gets to be a little hardcore uh there's um obviously there's this really just harrowing middle segment where um Boudica is tied up and whipped and while she's being whipped she's being forced to watch both her daughters get tied down and raped and for a tv movie we see quite a bit of this um there is like a sudden abrupt cut and suddenly everything's over like there's footage that was taken out um but even so there's just enough there that does make it like really unsettling and really hard to watch um and i think the performances do a lot for that and so it seems like the material's heavy enough but the performances actually do help immensely um 
And so after the events of this, uh, we have our... Blunt's character does get tend to get a little more hardcore. I believe she actually says the line uh, when they're talking about the antagonist, and she says, when we catch him, I want you to set me on fire, and then I will embrace him so that he burns to death or something like that. And it's like, you can sort of see, like, little echoes of what would end up being uh, the Full Metal Bitch. It's, like, coming out, like, 11 years before her movie incarnation. Um... And then eventually, you know, she gets to do the whole... She gets to paint up her face and do the whole warrior thing at the end. And she even shows up. And it's like, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna go into battle, mother, just like I said. And, of course, her mom has to say, like, oh, no, you're going to you're gonna live long. You're going to be a queen. It's going to be all that. And it's like, no, like, I came... Like, the whole reason I came here was to die. Like, that's the whole point. Like, I just came here to bite it as gloriously as possible. Uh, and her mother just has to say, oh, okay, I guess... Um, and she does basically get, you know, a, a TV movie death. Like, this, like if you're thinking about a TV version, a cheap TV version of the battle scenes in Braveheart, you get it. Like, her, her glorious death is getting wiped once by a prop sword in a sort of jumpy-looking scene. Um, but nevertheless, um, there is still some stuff that does work and some stuff that seems a bit uh, off. Because like I was saying, we've got the whole vendetta plot that happens after that middle segment but in the meantime um we have like it's okay so there's the whole thing about how uh nero was ruling and he had this supposed uh sexual relationship with his mother this incestuous relationship so this movie decides to explore that territory but the thing is is that I feel like with that being like history and one of those things it's like it's alleged and all that they probably could have done something like um, maybe create like a subtle sexual tension or just give this really off vibe when he's around his mom and the way they act towards each other um, and sort of give it this, you know, maybe that was true, maybe it wasn't sort of thing, um, which could have, like I said, given this whole sort of tension to it, but uh, nope, they decided to go flat out porny with it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, in this very awkward sort of... I'm not even sure exactly. It's like it's a TV movie, but I'm not quite sure what it aired on. Um, because we do get stuff like uh, this weird-ass sex scene to where it's almost like the makers of the movie are having a little too much fun. Like, I mean, you, you could say, like, oh, they really went for it. Like, they weren't going to shy away from that at all. Um, which these days, you know, would be really easy to commend. But it's like, watching it, it's almost like they're having too much fun with that setup, to where it was like, did, did you know that Nero supposedly had a sexual relationship with his mother? Let's, like, really, let's, like, let's, like, do everything we can with that. Uh, so we've got, like, her laying on the bed, basically offering herself to him, saying, like, you know this is what settles you down. And it's like, what in the fuck? <laughs> Um, and it's, and yeah, and then it's, it just feels really off, and that happens again, like, the way they find these ways to sort of, it almost feels like they cheapen things by trying to give this movie some kind of sexual appeal. Like I said, those are definitely not the scenes you want to do that with, but then there are these other scenes where, um, Buriga decides that she's pretty much ready to fuck, like, right in the middle of a battle scene, so there's, luckily there's just a tent there while carnage is still going on outside, um, and I'm not quite sure how this is supposed to all fit in, but nevertheless, it's there. Like I said, like we were talking about with the Irresistible, I guess they took the whole sex sells approach a little too far, but whatever. Um, so, um, and talking about, I actually want to just want to talk about Blonde some more, because that's the only reason I'm here. I mean, look at this movie. This, there is no other reason I would watch something like this. <laughs> so, what else Blunt is able to do, which is really great... Um, it is really impressive how this is, like, the very first credit on her IMDb page, and it's such a cheesy TV movie like this, um, but how good she still is in it, because after the whole, you know, rape and whipping scene happens, um, there's this really genuinely sort of powerful moment when Boudica brings herself down and, like, tells herself to get back up, and then she unties her daughters and all that, and the first thing she says is, like, you know, don't cry. Like, whatever you do, don't show tears or anything like that. Just be warriors and get up and walk away from this. Um, and the when we see Blunt sort of holding this in, like, at first it's... At first it makes me want to say, like, uh... You can see, like, all the pain in her face and all that. When it's like, she's walking away from this. She has to stay, like, zombie-like, practically. She's walking away from this. Um, but I don't even know if it's pain that's coming through. It's just, like, this numbness. 
Um, that just it's just really powerful to see her almost this. It's like she's supposed to be emotionless, but we can still see what she's feeling after what has just happened. Um, and and that's really powerful too. But and keeping like melodrama out of it. Uh, which is really nice, and how well she's able to pull that off, and she has many times, she would many times later in her career as well, even still. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you don't really, not only would you not expect it from a person, um, an actress who's, this is their first credit on IMDb, but also um, just from a TV movie, you don't really expect moments to be this powerful when you walk away from them, um, that actually go as far as they do. Um, and how the and there also the following scene where all this has been intercut with uh, her lover committing suicide by stabbing himself. And so after all this has gone down and after she's hidden the tears and gone through all this, she comes across his body by herself. Um, and once again, skipping the melodrama, she doesn't instantly cry. It's this really skillful thing she does where she seems like she's still kind of numb to what's happened. But then that numbness we can actually see wear off like in real time. And we see like the devastation wash over her and she goes from trying to hold back um, to it just gradually coming to her. And then when she breaks down it actually feels all the more real because of that. Um, like I said, this is... this good of a performance should not be from a first-time actress in a TV movie that's like this. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, and so, and then obviously it gets to a pretty unsatisfying climax. Like, we do have a battle here and there, but there's an awful lot of cuts, and it's clear nobody's really making much contact with anybody. Um, and then there's no impact in the final revenge, because they're building it up. I really would have loved to have seen that thing Blunt wanted to do, where she set herself on fire and then set him on fire by hugging him, uh, just for the ultimate revenge. Uh, no. Um, some kids dogpile on him, and then they just walk away with his head. That's it. Uh, it's like the big build-up for this dude being the big, bad, bad guy. Uh, that's that's what we get. Some kids cut his head off, but we don't even really see much except for them you know, roughhousing with him, and then uh, voila, they've got his head. Uh, so, there it is. Uh, Eli Roth took notes uh, a couple years later when he made Hospital 2, I guess. So, uh... And, uh, yeah, and as far as, uh, Kingston goes, being the star and all that, um, I do think maybe her performance would have benefited from, like, a more cinematic stage. Like, I don't know if the cheapness around her sort of makes her performance seem a bit smaller and less impactful. I know that kind of seems like it might be the reverse. Like, if it was still this performance, uh, on a bigger stage if it would still if it make it look even smaller but i i feel like it maybe would have helped if her environment had been enhanced a little bit but it all just sort of feels like it's in the same sort of place of this is going no farther than a small screen so uh and it's yeah i mean uh, but she does still you know have like the the good lines and all that like the what is it like will slice up in your veins and your blood will water our soil or something. Uh, it's like stuff like that, you know, I could see this working, but like I said, at the end of the day, it is just this cheesy TV movie that nobody has ever really mentioned. They don't really mention when they're talking about Blunt and her filmography and all that, so it's just there is something that exists. But like, there, there are actually some decent elements in here that probably could have made for a an interesting, if, you know, cliche in this territory thing. Because, like, what else can you really do in this territory except make a Vendetta movie? Not much. But, um, what the, like I said, it is surprising in some senses where they go, even if it's not the best way to go. The fact that they do go there is saying something. So, uh... Yeah, so that's so that's what that is. So that's what these are. Um, so uh, obviously the next one is going to be the movie that made everybody know who she was very quickly. Uh, then, like I said, we'll get, we'll tackle those TV episodes. Then my summer of love, and then Mary Bobbins will end this. So uh, not very much to go on that. So uh, until all that stuff, uh, I think that's it.